Today's video is brought to you by Underlucky Stars, a brand new sponsor that makes beautiful personalized star maps that show the unique alignment of stars at a specific place and time chosen by you. More on that in a bit. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Casual Criminalist in what I feel is going to be a very long episode because I ran the word count on the, uh, the oh, hello if you're new here, what happens is uh, a writer, one of the writers for this channel, in this case David, writes the script for me, I read it, I've never read it before, but I ran the word count on this before I got started with this episode. And I sent David an email, I was like, hey David, uh, can we divide this into two parts because it's an absolute beast? <laughs> he just wrote back, basically being like, dude. I wrote it as one piece. It's better as one piece. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you probably know best. But I'm like, this is going to be an... I mean, for a podcast, I feel these are not insanely long. But when it see when you see like a YouTube video, it's like an hour and something, an hour and 30, hour and 40. I don't think we've cracked the two hour mark yet. But I mean, that is ridiculously long for a YouTube video. But uh, we didn't divide it into two parts. It is a one parter. We're going to be here for a while. It's Monday morning thought I'd start the week uh, bravely, honestly. This is uh, Dorothea Puente, the Devil's Golden Girl. Uh, as I briefly just mentioned, the uh, the shtick on this show, shtick's kind of got negative connotations. I don't mean that. I mean like uh, the theme, the way things work. What we do here is I'll read it. I've never read it before. Uh, and we kind of explore it. We learn it together. I don't know this case. All I know is that David has given me a pronunciation guide on Dorothea here. And I'm definitely going to screw it up and call her Dorothea many times. Because for some reason, that's how I want to say that word in my mind. So apologies ahead of time. Um, let's just crack on, we'll, shall we? Thank you, David. Thank you. Oh, also thanks to Jen. If it is blood you seek, you're welcome to join us. Who adds in the wonderful sounds and music and images and all of that stuff afterwards. <laughs> also known as an editor. Simon, you can't use that. You just use that word rather than describing the job every time. Anyway, enough rambling. Let's get into it. In September 1998, Alvaro Montea went missing, and it would be a lie to say the many people gave a damn. Such was the general attitude toward mentally ill vagrants in California in the 1980s. Then, just as now, they were treated as a dime a dozen. I feel then just as now. Don't we treat people better these days, like disadvantaged people, in whatever way? Maybe not. Maybe that's way too like rose-colored glasses. Wait, that's when you look at the past, isn't it? No, that's uh... Oh God, Simon, your Monday morning brain is absolutely showing today. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you're just not very bright. Um, what I mean is maybe we don't treat people better than we used to in the past, and that's that's sad. Especially someone like Montoya, male, middle-aged, hearing voices, devoid of family, and yet another impoverished addition to the state's burgeoning and neglected Hispanic population. Perhaps if he were young, blonde, and female, someone would raise the alarm sooner, but a hobo is a hobo. You see them, you ignore them, and when they disappear without a trace, you assume they have probably moved on. That is, if you spared them a single thought in the first place, or at least that might be the thinking of a killer. In the 1980s, California's state capital of Sacramento was still, by the standards of Los Angeles and San Francisco, a relatively small city. It was a government town, located 95 miles or 152 kilometers inland, smack dab in the middle of a valley composed of dry grasslands, occasional deserts, and, thanks to the gold rush, infrequent forests before rising into the forbidding landscape of the California mountains. Sacramento has none of the appeal of the Oceanside, Oceanside metropolises or the glamour of Hollywood. So for years, it had evaded the waves of migration that lured every artist, actor, entrepreneur, con man, drug addict, and feckless idiot to the sun-kissed and laid-back Pacific coast. I mean, yeah, it's also like, I get why people move to California, at least on the face of things, because it's like, look, if I lived in America and you're like living in, I don't know, somewhere in the north, like close to Canada, where it's like really cold and there's just fields and shit, and you'd be like, you know, where's like got good pay, like high minimum wage in California, right? So even if you're unskilled or there's, I don't know, if you are skilled, probably better wages anyway. I mean, sure, it's more expensive, but the weather's really nice. There's beaches. It's warm. <laughs> I'd be like, would I rather stay in the cold? And I'm sure people like Simon, the cold's lovely. I'm sure there's like, you know, it's the north, that it's beautiful, there's bison and shit. But I don't know, in my mind I'm like, I'd like it to be warm. <laughs> Please, all year round, sounds great. But then here I am, not moving to anywhere where the weather's like warm all year round, so 
I guess it doesn't really matter that much. But more recently, Sacramento had been swiftly growing. Between just 1980 and 1988, the population had increased from 275,000 to 350,000 people, an increase of 27% in eight years. That's an insane influx of people. And with this massive explosion of population came the same epidemic of homelessness that already consumed Los Angeles and San Francisco a few days prior. For the first time in the city's history, shanty towns were being erected. The homicide rate spiked. In just eight years, sleeping bags and alleyways discarded drug paraphernalia and unkempt and mentally disturbed people muttering to themselves became an unfortunately common sight. When the homeless wandered too far into well-to-do residential neighborhoods or began disturbing a local business, they were removed by the police. <laughs> it's a good solution. There's a homeless problem. What should we do? Make homelessness illegal. I remember I went to... This was years ago. It was like, I don't know, 2000 and late 2000s. So at least like 12, 13 years ago. I went to New York. And so I was just like, I, was, I can't remember. It was, I think I was staying in some hostel or something. And I was just having a chat. And there was a guy from somewhere in America or somewhere in New York staying there. And we were just chatting and stuff. And then I was like, there don't seem to be, you know, in, in I don't know, movies or whatever. You're like, New York, there must be loads of homeless people. And I was like, there's, it's really nice. There's not that many homeless people. And I'm like, how did, what, what happened to, the, to this guy who's from New York? And he's like, oh, was it Rudy Giolani who was the mayor then or something like that? Whoever the mayor was. He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People think that he just put them all on a big boat, sent it out to sea and set it on fire. And I'm just like, holy sh**. <laughs> so no one knows? I mean, I'm sure that something happens, but I was like, dude, <laughs> okay. Otherwise, they were ignored and left to sleep rough outside in the city's temper temperate climate. And if they were mentally competent enough to fill out the paperwork, they could subsist off a small welfare benefits program. Thus, there arose in Sacramento in the 1980s two solitudes of rich and poor that rarely interacted. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I, I realize with my statement about the homeless people in New York, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean to be offensive. The guy's joke was obviously offensive, it's not my joke. Um, and also, I'd, my, my point about like making homelessness illegal was definitely a joke. Uh, obviously, like you need to do something about it, like through welfare programs, not through making it illegal. That makes no sense, and it's obviously not going to work. Alvaro Montoya was 52 years old, had been homeless for years due to a mental illness that went undiagnosed and untreated, and spent his days floating in and out of alleyways and shelters. His was not a difficult case. Montoya's mental illness would likely have been eased with basic medication, and he could have gotten a job and a normal life if anyone had deigned to help him during his many decades on the streets. Alvaro Montoya was mistakenly dubbed Alberto by the local gringos, and subsequently nicknamed Bert by the people who knew him. He was a big, lovable teddy bear of a man, and irrespective of his mental issues, he had always been gentle and friendly. One day, Burt came to the attention of Judy Moyes, a street counselor with the Volunteers of America. She took an unusual amount of interest in him. Judy's job was to locate homeless people who were mentally ill and not capable of seeking welfare benefits for themselves. She checked up on Burt regularly, and on the 3rd of February 1988, Judy managed to find Burt's place to stay at a boarding house run by a kindly old lady in her 70s at, uh, at 1426th F Street. Burt would be able to pay his rent with part of his welfare check now that Judy had signed him up for the benefits program. Slowly but surely, Bert got his life together. Within a few months, he'd purchased clean clothes, was washing and grooming regularly, and had come to grips with his mental illness. By all metrics, Bert was on the mend, and this was a successful uh, success story of volunteerism and compassionate charity work. Judy was delighted to see this since she had become fond of his effortlessly, effortless, effortlessly, oh, this goddamn word, every video I do, I just can't say it, and I'm sorry. It's, it's a struggle succeeding effortlessly. A uh, cheerful and childlike demeanor. Here was a man who was down on his luck by no fault of his own. He was a genuinely good person. In August of 1988, Burke communicated to Judy that he would like to move on from the boarding house. Then, in September, Alvaro Bert Montoya disappeared without a trace. Oh my, wait. Is Dorothea? Oh, she's the baddie. I just realized I am like casual criminalist. Let's be real, dudes. It's, uh, it's mostly the guys committing the crimes and the women being victims and i don't think that's just a statistic for this show <laughs> i think that's a statistic for the world uh so i was like yeah dorothea when's this guy gonna kill her and i'm like oh wait no oh god i got it wrong this this sweet man um is going to yeah oh oh okay <laughs> at least that's what i'm assuming shows how little i really don't read these ahead you know it now the lunatics running the asylum In October, while doing her regular check-ins, Judy got wind of the fact that Bert was no longer staying at 100 and f oh, 
how in america how do you have like 1426 it's that's so long just break it up into two or use a hundred why <laughs> it's very long names f street that nobody could con and nobody could confirm where he was he had not been seen for a month he was not back on the streets he was not seen back at the shelters he was nowhere to be found judy was then told that he was visiting a doctor in mexico to detox and was due to return in a few days what the homeless guy who lives in a shelter or um in his welfare accommodation just flew to mexico for some weird mexican medicine please <laughs> weeks passed there was no word from bert judy got more anxious something didn't feel right yes yeah, something shouldn't have felt right when he's like he went to mexico how how did he afford to go to mexico who is this doctor in mexico going to mexico just feels like an excuse someone tells you when they murdered someone and put them in their attic wait a minute he's dead yep <laughs> Another month passed, and in November, Judy got a call from a man who said, Hi, my name is Don Anthony. I, I, I mean, Michelle Obergon. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hi, I'm Simon. I mean, Mike. <laughs> what? I'm Bert's uncle. We're here in Shreveport, Utah. Bert told me to call you and let you know he's all right. Bert had apparently returned from Mexico on November the 6th, come back to 1426th F Street, packed up his stuff, and was transported away by a group of people claiming to be his relatives. But Judy wasn't buying any of this b****. Bert had previously informed Judy that he had no family to speak of whatsoever. Especially not Don Michelle. I mean, Don, whoops, Michelle. On November the 7th, 1988, Judy Moyes filed a missing persons report with the police. She suspected foul play. She did not know why anyone would target a happy-go-lucky, mentally imbalanced former vagrant. To the credit of the Sacramento police, they did not brush off the report of a, ho a former homeless man going AWOL or even assign it a low priority. Sure, Bert could have moved on without a trace like a lot of other transients with mental illnesses, but that didn't explain the dodgy phone call from the obviously fake relative. The cop dutifully paid a visit to 1426th F Street the same day. Yeah, this is the thing. If you just shut up. Hey, wait, who said he went to Mexico? Uh, Judy was told. Told by who? I don't know. Um, maybe someone at the shelter or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, if they'd have just shut up and had just gone missing without making that dodgy phone call and getting the name wrong, you amateur, um, this would have just been swept under the rug. No one would have cared. The police would be like, meh, homeless people go missing all the time. <laughs> because police, why? The boarding house on F Street had a very specific kind of clientele. Tough cases. Alcoholics, drug addicts, people just out of prison, the mentally ill, violent people, former thieves you name it people had come and gone out of the boarding house all the time it wasn't unusual for this crowd to disappear without leaving a forwarding address and a lot of them slid back into their old ways so on the surface it was possible that bert could have just done the same thing alternately the house on f street was chock full of potential suspects who might have done something to bert yeah this i feel like could be quite open and shut because if someone there did it did something to him either the police are going to run into that person pretty quick and you know do something about it or they're not and I feel like that's where our police action is going to end. Even though there's the dodgy phone call. I don't know. I just feel they're not going to dig much deeper than that. Because how do you do that? Like you go to Utah and try to find someone to coordinate across state lines and all that stuff. I don't know. This was the 1980s. I feel like that's even hard today. The number of times I catch a criminal. Like, yeah, he just went to a different state and no one cared. It's like, oh, okay. Happens way too often. The landlady greeted the beat cop when he arrived. She was concerned about Bert and endeavored to be helpful. She introduced him to the boarding houses, a residence, a group of near do wells composed of men and women. Some of the residents were drunk, some were drug addicts, and some were mentally unstable. The police officer asked them a few questions, and amid a number of disjointed and distressing life biographies that were all tragic in their turn, the residents all affirmed that Bert Montoya had left with relatives the day before. Okay. Wait, so he was really there and he came back and he collected all his stuff? I assumed that when he went to Mexico, that was code for he'd been, he's been murdered. Um, and then some people came to collect his stuff, but without him. Wait, so this is a twist I did not expect. As the officer was leaving, one of the ten tenants, John Sharp, approached him and slipped him a note. It instructed the officer to meet him at a separate location. At their separate meeting place, around the corner, Sharp told the policeman, the most astounding story here we go this is this is getting exciting sharp claimed that the residents had been intimidated into lying to him but had not returned on november the 6th and been ferried away by relatives to utah but had not been seen since september okay well uh just like old fat boy says Furthermore, Sharp expressed concerns about strange occurrences at the boarding house. People were disappearing without explanation. Sharp said foul smells were emanating from one of the rooms. He heard thumps and bumps in the night. Sharp also expected, uh, suspected that Bert had been murdered and buried in the back garden. Oh my god. <laughs> Why? 
<laughs> in New York? This place has a back garden? Wait, is this New York or New York? Well, I know, we're in Sacramento, aren't we? I was just talking about homelessness in New York, like an idiot. In my mind, this is happening in New York. I've just ruined it for myself. It's in Sacramento. Unfortunately, Sharp had no evidence to corroborate these allegations. Sharp neither drank nor did drugs, so it was not clear why he'd fabricate such claims. On November 11th, 1988, a team of three policemen led by Sergeant John Cabrera of uh, the Homicide and Missing Persons Division arrived at 1426 F Street. That's I'm going to say it from now on because reading it 1426 F Street every time is grinding on me. Grating on me? Grinding on me. Grating on me. Grinding on me would mean something else. The landlady greeted the policemen and let them in. These, they asked permission to do a sweep of the house. At this point in the investigation, they did not have a warrant, but the landlady said that they could search the house anyway. The sooner they did, the sooner they could get to the bottom of what was going on. During Cabrera's sweep of the house, he looked in drawers, cabinets, closets, underbeds, and even tapped the walls to detect a change in sound in case a body had been concealed within them. I guess that's the thing. The beat cops like this guy told me a story. They think that people are being murdered in this house. And then the detectives cover. They're like, better check the walls for bodies. I am glad I'm not a detective. There were no illegal drugs drug stashed in the house. All that Cabrera found was a bottle of pills that belonged to the landlady and curious and a curious empty pill bottle on the floor for florazepam made out to one Dorothy Miller. Upon inquiring with the landlady, Cabrera established that Dorothy Miller was a relative who'd come to stay and probably left that pill bottle behind. A quick check on the name of the current tenants revealed that none of them went by the name Dorothy Miller. Only one woman, a female in her 70s and a recovering alcoholic, was staying at the boarding house at the time. Cabrera confirmed that the tenant did not take florazepam. The landlady was a former nurse in her late 70s who'd served at the Battle of Bataan in 1942 when the Japanese had achieved a slow and bloody victory, so it was relatively easy for the experienced nurse to track her borders, various ailments and medications. Oh, sorry, I was just confusing the, uh, the landlady with the tenant um, because they're both females in their 70s. Uh, but the landlady's the nurse, so she was the one. She was like monitoring who was on what drugs and whatnot. Okay, but something didn't feel right. It felt like everybody in the house was keeping something from Cabrera. So who was intimidating these people and telling falsehoods and half truths? Cabrera turned his attention to who might have harmed Bert Montoya. Not many of the current residents seemed to fit the profile of murderer or kidnapper. Most were either too unwell or infirm to carry out a crime, or didn't drive, or didn't seem to have any known associates to pose as Montoya's relatives. There was one possible suspect, John, uh, Benjamin Fink, a binge-drinking alcoholic who blew his social security check the moment he got it, and was always hard up for money, who had departed from F Street around the same time as Montoya. Or it could be one of the current boarders, John McCauley, who had been there several year for the several years and was hired occasionally to do yard work at the house. I I know it's a super controversial thing to say, and I always was wondering why it was so controversial. Uh, I, I guess I know why, because people should like have their individual freedoms, even if they are on social security or we call it benefits in the UK. But if someone's an alcoholic and they're staying in a welfare house and they're still just giving cash money, which they know which is going to be blown on alcohol. Why is the idea of just giving them money that can't be spent on alcohol such a terrible thing to say? Or giving them like 80% of the, the, the money as, okay, you can exchange this for food. You can't exchange it for alcohol. I don't know. That's, that's, just, I don't, maybe I should not say this because it's always like quite, people have a problem with that. And I guess I, you know, I believe in like individual freedom for people to do whatever they want. But in this situation, it's just hurting everybody. It just seems like this poor guy. He's just like, and then the state's aiding him in destroying his life. And I know, I understand, also, yes, I know that we can all just, just destru- choose to destroy our lives if we want to, but should the government help us with that? I don't think so, isn't it? Anyway, let's just move on before I get cancelled for something. John Sharp wasn't considered a suspect at the time since he was the one who reported the possibility of a crime in the first place. But then again, Sharp had departed the boarding house not long after he had given the incriminating information to the police. Cabrera then asked for permission to dig around a little in the backyard, which the landlady gave despite the officers not even having a warrant to follow up on Sharp's allegations the bodies were buried out there. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if you have a warrant or not. If the police come to your house and they're like, hey, can we have a look in your back garden for a body? And he'd be like, I don't know, I'd probably say no, <laughs> even if I was like, there's no body back there, but I'd need like, wait, do you suspect me of burying a body back there? Because if yes, lawyer, if it's like you think a serial killer came through my neighborhood 20 years ago and buried a body back there, I'd be like, have at it. But I'd be like, 
I don't know. <laughs> I didn't bury any bodies back there, but I just want a lawyer just to make sure that I'm not going to get screwed for something I didn't do. So yeah, I'd probably say no. But if I ran a hotel and something suspect happens in the hotel, uh, in one of the rooms, and the police arrived and were like, we need to look in one of the rooms, I wouldn't be like, I need a warrant. I'd be like, yes, come on in. Please have a look. I also don't want to, you know, if there's a body in there, I'd rather have it dealt with. So yeah, they don't need a warrant. If the person says, come on in. Three policemen headed out to the backyard, but only two had shovels, so they borrowed a third shovel from the landlady. The three men set about digging three separate parts in various areas of the garden. After 40 minutes of work, one of the holes yielded strange scraps of fabric that appeared to belong to either a dress or a woman's blouse, and also small round scraps of hardened, undyed leather. Uh oh. I mean, that is. I guess there's no body down there so far, but that is definitely keep digging, boys. The vine was curious, but would have nothing to do with Bert Montoya's disappearance since the fabric was so decayed that it was clear it had been in the ground for much longer than the two months that it had been missing. Also, of course, Bert was not in the habit of wearing women's clothing. But also, the beat cop who came around and interviewed all those people was saying, like, people have been going missing. It's suspicious. Stuff's going on here. Uh, so they knew this as well. And also, if you're like, oh, it's not Bert's, is it? <laughs> we just vowed a blouse. Ah, oh, may as well give up. There's just women buried here. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. Shortly after finding the fabric and the leather, the men's excavation was briefly interrupted by an obstacle. When the men were about two feet deep into the same hole, they what the policeman quickly concluded was an old tree trunk. After smashing it with the end of a shovel once or twice, it still wouldn't budge. Carrera got into the hole, grabbed hold of the tree trunk, and pulled it so the men could continue digging. Finally, it came loose. It wasn't a tree trunk, it was a human femur. Oh dear. Any flesh on it had already decomposed, there was nothing but bone. It had laid there for much longer than Bert Montoya had been missing. Shortly thereafter, they found a human foot still encased in a small women's tree. Uh-oh. This got real. Carrera called the landlady over to the hall, uh, showed her the human remains and she gasped in surprise. Now, just before we continue with today's video, let me tell you a bit about today's fantastic sponsor, Underlucky Stars. They're a new sponsor over here, and what they do is they make beautiful, personalized star maps that show the alignment of stars at a date, time, and place of your choosing. Let me show you. It's a big thing, isn't it? It's, um, basically, I chose, this is when me and my wife got married. That is the star alignment uh, above where we got married that very day which is pretty amazing it's in this beautiful frame the glass looks great the paper looks great it's printed on this high quality i think they call it museum quality like matte paper don't touch the glass simon you'll mess it all up this is the original map maker for stars uh their uh, proprietary method of mapping stars verified by astrophysicists at nasa so brilliant like i say this is a fantastic gift for valentine's day just around the corner all you need to do to get 10 percent discount by the way is go to underluckystars.com forward slash criminalist you get 10 percent off if you use the code criminalist and uh yeah it's a gift that uh, your loved one certainly won't forget thank you to underlucky stars for sponsoring and now back to today's video meet dorothea puente a few hours later, Sergeant Carrera had brought the landlady of 1426 F Street to the police station for questioning. Her name was Dorothea Puente. The landlady? Oh, I guess David didn't tell me her name, because the, otherwise throughout the whole introduction I'd be like, she's the guilty one. She's the one. It's the landlady. But why did she let them dig in the garden? and be like, go get a warrant? There's loads of bodies back there that I don't want you to discover. And maybe the judge won't get it, or maybe I could get rid of the bodies while you're like, I don't know, if I was her at that point, I'd be like, well, I can't get rid of this too many bodies back there. <laughs> They'd be like, it's time for me to make a trip to Mexico. <laughs> her name was Dorothea Puente. She sat there staring plaintively at Carrera from behind her giant granny glasses. Her bulking handbag was propped up on the interrogation table next to the wall, and she was cradling a paper cup of water in her hands. She was dressed in a dark blue polka dotted dress with white lace around the short sleeves, which looked like it was fashioned in the late 1940s. She had silver hair cut into a bob several decades out of date and wise and wrinkled skin that she made no attempt to hide with makeup. She was missing all of her teeth. Of a short, thin, and frail-looking frame, Dorothea Puente resembled Estelle Getty's character Sophia from the 1980 sitcom The Golden Girls. I've never seen The Golden Girls, so I have no idea what this lady looks like. You're old, you sad ghetto f A background check had established that Puente was on parole for forgery, theft, and drugging people's drinks with sedatives and painkillers. Oh my god. What are you doing being allowed to run like a... a uh, a place where people on drugs 
come to get clean or not be homeless and stuff oh my god when she was arrested in may 1982 she was in possession of a ticket to flee to mexico dorothy apprentice had been given five years which she served three before being released on good behavior in 1985 uh-oh don't give her bail She's already displayed a tendency to want to go to Mexico. <laughs> I like how going to Mex- I thought that was just a thing in the movies where it's like, uh-oh, the law's finally caught up to us, boys. We gotta go to Mexico. I just assumed that there would be, like, extradition treaty nowadays between Mexico and the US. Well, this is the 1980s, so maybe that's changed. But I feel like you'd really have to go further than Mexico. Maybe you just go to Mexico first, and then you're like, I don't know, go somewhere else. <laughs> I thought that was just for the movies. But I mean, they always get it from somewhere, don't they? From there, Puente operated a boarding house on 1426F Street with rooms for nine people. The landlady had gained a reputation for taking on needy cases with nowhere else to go, but and also tough and violent cases. She was very patient with alcoholics and drug addicts. She did not tolerate any sorts of substance abuse or criminal activity on the premises. She ran a tight, clean ship, but was also very gentle, caring, and empathetic towards her tenants. It was Puente's reputation that motivated charity worker Judy Moyes to find a spot for Bert Montoya at Puente's boarding house a few months prior. It was only when Bert went missing and Puente seemed to be deliberately concealing where he'd gone that Judy suspected that something was not right with the old woman. Meanwhile, so positive was Puente's reputation in her local Hispanic neighborhood that she gained the nickname of La Doctora, relating to her time as a nurse during the Battle of Bataan in the Philippines in 1942. The problem was that Dorothy Puente had never served as a nurse in the Philippines and would have been just 13 at the time of the bloody, bloody Battle of Bataan. Despite her appearance and claims the contrary, Dorothea Puente was just 59 years old. Oh my. Oh my. Sergeant Cabrera commenced the interview by confirming Puente's personal details, including her age. She claimed that she was Mexican-American, raised in a family of 18 children. Oh my god, the past. And that Puente was her maiden name. Cabrera confirmed that Puente had lived at 146 F Street since 1978 until she was arrested in May 1982 for the aforementioned charges of forgery, theft, and drugging. Oh wait, so she lived at the place that she was the le later the landlady of? That's weird. Wait. Did she... Did she go there? Murder the previous landlady? Forge the stuff to make it into her name and then kind of take over her life? That's intense. It's just a theory, but that would be intense. She then returned to F Street when she was released from prison in September 1985. Both before and after her prison term, she paid rent uh, to her nephew Ricardo, and both before and after her prison term, she had maintained a boarding house for the disadvantaged. When Cabrera pointed out there were a few inconsistencies in Dor Dorothea Puente's statements to Judy Moyes regarding Alvaro Bert Montana's, uh, Montoya's disappearance, Puente threw up her hands and said that her memory wasn't so good and she didn't know at the time that she had to remember every detail. Montoya had told her that he was visiting a doctor in Mexico, and when he returned on November the 6th, he had vacated his room and left with a group of relatives for Utah. Puente then asked Cabrera if his family had been in contact with police. Cabrera replied no, and that even if they had, he would need to physically see that Bert Montoya was alive and well in order to rule him out as a missing person. Cabrera added... <laughs> It's like, yeah, 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 just give the police a ring and tell them that, that he's fine. It's like, that's not going to work. The police are not that dumb. Cabrera added that Judy had made it clear that Alvaro Bert Montoya did not have any family to speak of. He also pointed out that John Sharper testified to the police that he had not seen Bert since September 1988 and that he did not return home on November the 6th. Dorothea insisted that Bert had been at F Street on November the 6th and claimed Sharp was lying. Sharp had evidently been behind on his rent payments, not paying for the month of October until November the 3rd, having blown his welfare check on gambling and alcohol. Again, we come around to like, why should... Should gambling gambling here's some money from the government that you should be spending on food and lodging because you don't have any money and otherwise you're homeless don't go to the casino okay i'm trusting you not to go to the casino is this a good idea is this the best idea in the world does we do we need that level of agency according to dorothea shop was lying out of bitterness because she had recently evicted him indeed all the other tenants affirmed that bert had been at f street on the 6th. Yeah, but the problem is, she holds a lot of leverage over them because she's like, this is where you live, it's very cheap, and you get looked after. And if you say anything bad or like anything like that, or if you don't lie for me, I'm gonna kick you out. 
It's that's some strong leverage. At that point, Cabrera turned the conversation to Benjamin Fink, the 55-year-old alcoholic who had departed from the boarding house in August 1988 after a stay of just two months. Dorothea claimed that he was always out drinking, blowing his welfare check on booze, and getting extra money by selling his blood at the blood bank. Do they accept it if you're an alcoholic? I feel like you'll fill out that form and they'll be like, do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? And you'll be like, oh, I am an alcoholic. Or if you lie, then they're going to take that blood sample and be like, yo, there's loads of alcohol in here, isn't there? We can't take this. And then on the side, I'm like, just thinking about that and expanding my, well, I'm sure there's going to be a deeply unpopular thought. The idea that, okay, so we can use his blood bank money to buy alcohol, if that's what he wants. And he can use his welfare money from the government to buy food and not gambling or he can gamble his blood bank money whatever the blood bank money is his money he earned it with his blood eventually his drinking got so bad that dorothea evicted him at which point she claimed that fink moved back to Mar marysville california cabrera told her bluntly that given fink was such a notorious drunk always getting thrown out of bars and getting into mild scrapes with police in sacramento that someone would have picked fink up in marysville by now for being drunk and disorderly yet he had stayed completely off the radar and they could not find fink's new address that's because fink is buried in the garden at this point, Puente volunteered to let the police put a tap on her phone so they could monitor all of her conversations to establish that she was telling the truth if either Ben Fink or Alvaro Montoya called. Um, what? You shouldn't tell her that. You should just get a warrant to tap her phones. Don't tell her. Don't ask permission. That's weird. Or, it, cause, and it, well, to be fair, it's actually quite smart in a way because if she agrees to that, they know that she knows that they're not going to call because <laughs> they're buried in the garden. Cabrera then addressed the fact that a few hours earlier, they had found the remains of a human being in Puente's backyard. Yeah, why would I bring that one up? She knew they were digging in the garden. She's probably sitting there being like, when are you going to bring up those bodies? Huh? There's a lot of bodies buried in the garden. I saw that femur. She began to say, but if that body was Alvaro, but Cabrera interrupted her by saying, I don't think it was Alvaro. I'm not sure that body was put there this decade. And I don't think it was Ben Fink either to be truthful. Throughout the interview, Cabrera used the bluff that the police had been getting reports of other disappearances and rumors uh, uh, and rumors that dead bodies were being buried in Dorothea's backyard for over a year at this point. This was a lie. If the police had gotten such reports a year ago, they would have arrived to inspect the place long before the disappearance of Alvaro Bert Montoya. The fact was, at this point, that Cabrera had already realized that the body they'd found in the backyard only a few hours before belonged to a woman, neither Montoya nor Fink, but someone else entirely. But Dorothea Puente did not budge. Cabrera then asked about the one-inch layer of concrete that was poured over where the body was found, claiming after much hemming and whoring that it must have been uh, laid down around February or March 1988, shortly after Bert Montoya arrived at the house. According to Cabrera, there had been digging and pouring of concrete all over the yard in various places, which Dorothea slowly and vaguely corroborated, not really supplying firm dates for when the work was done. Why are you pouring concrete to stop my... <laughs> if the police go digging in your backyard for bodies, an inch of concrete is knocked, they will be like, oh, well, that's impenetrable. I guess we better stop. Definitely nothing buried down there. Just concrete. More, more, more concrete. As we had done the work, Puente mentions tenant John McCauley, who had, who among a number of other men had done casual labor for over the years. Indeed, Puente was known around the neighborhood for giving work to ex-convicts to do some periodic landscaping in her backyard. Dorothea was quick to underline that she didn't do any of the work herself because she had a bad heart. And she's so old, except she's not old. I mean, she's 59. It's not young, but it's not like this old lady persona that she's putting on. Cabrera then asked Dorothea if she'd ever used powdered lye in her backyard, at which point Dorothea began to mutter to herself about whether John McCauley had ever used it anywhere. She then remembered that at some point, maybe a few years ago, they'd put fertilizer and potting soil in the ground to soften it up for growing things. Cabrera pointed out then that in the hole where he found the body, there have been traces of lye, which is often used to speed up the decomposition of a corpse. Yeah, in fact, I'm like, I don't know what the other purpose for lye is, L-Y-E, other than uh, like decomposing bodies, because it came, it comes up in casual criminalist you know it's like how do you get it to decompose it with lie oh i'm sure it has another use otherwise you wouldn't be able to buy it puente shook her head and said there would be no reason for lie to be in the soil only two feet below the surface at this point cabrera asked dorothea point blank if she had any awareness that there was a body in the hole that his men had dug up she said no cabrera asked whether john mccauley or any of her other workers may have had some awareness that there was a body there and she said she didn't think so cabrera then started playing hardball i've got a man missing and nothing fits Dorothea, and there's one or two things I can surmise. And that is, Mr. Montoya is dead. No, he's not. 
Brenta immediately shot back with a vigorous shake of the head. Cabrera continued, I'm just trying to surmise here, and then we'll clear this up. He is dead, and either John McCauley killed him, or he met foul play by your hands. Those are my alternatives. And another alternative is out there, lying in their backyard, perhaps with other people. No, Puente said simply, with another shake of the head. At this point, she volunteered to hire a contractor who would go and tear up her whole backyard to prove that there were, bodies that there were no bodies there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not how it works. Be like, no, 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 I'll, I'll hire a guy. We'll go see if there's any bodies. You don't have to do that police <laughs> it's like yo the police are going back there and they're getting some archaeology sh you know like when you see archaeologists working they're doing like grid stuff they got those strings out they're like documenting little bowls and sh when csi go out there they do that on steroids not some dude called john who's a contractor just like yeah look i found a skull <laughs> It's not how it's going to work, Dorothea. You need to be a better criminal. If any digging has to be done, we're going to do the digging, Cabrera replied. I, afterwards, he should just state, Obviously, Dorothea, obviously. Are you so stupid? Dorothea raised her hand in the air as if taking a silent oath of honesty. Sir, I have never killed anybody. What about Mr. McCauley? Cabrera shot back. Puente asked, What reason would he have to kill anybody? I'd be like, if I was, uh, I'd be like, yeah, it was him. It was him. Definitely him. Yep. He did it. Unless there's a reason that she thinks she knows he didn't. Maybe his body's back there as well. Uh-oh. His body's back there, isn't it? It's buried in the garden. <laughs> oh my god, how many bodies are going to be? There's going to be so many bodies in the garden. Cabrera pivoted to how they were going to look into where the money was going from her tenants' welfare checks, especially since two ten tenants hadn't been seen in months. Oh, so the welfare checks go direct to her. This is giving a whole brand new crazy incentive. I was trying to work out where the finances were. Because I'm like, yo, let's assume she's killing these people for money. But they don't have any money. So what's she going to do? Steal their, like, meager belongings? But now I understand. The welfare checks go directly in a kind of weird version of what I was talking about. Where so the tenants don't go to the office, the government office. They collect their money and then they give it to her. The government gives the money directly to her apparently um which makes sense except when she kills them and buries them in the backyard and the checks just keep on coming and she just cashes them and it's like how many tenants do you have yeah like 90 like 90 i mean 86 current uh, 86 former i mean they're all living in one really small part of the garden uh and four in the bedrooms <laughs> this is there's there's the motive isn't it he pointed out that Puente had been arrested, forging such checks in the past, and had gone to prison for it. Wait, I'm confused. So, she's cashing forged checks? Welfare? I, the problem is I don't know how welfare works. In the US, and honestly, in the UK. Um, but there was just some comment in the other day. It's like, Simon doesn't understand this. He's so privileged. And it's like, yeah, I try, I try to. Uh, it's not like I'm purposefully ignorant. I just... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm pretty privileged. Um, it, that sounds bad. I just... It, it's reality. Um, and I don't really understand how this stuff works. I'd like to, but I just realized I don't understand how welfare checks work. How's she getting those? She's forging them, but aren't they made... Look, I don't know. Let's just move on. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Simon's ignorance is showing in the comments. It's going to be like, someone doesn't understand homelessness. He doesn't understand welfare. He doesn't understand poverty. And like, I try. I try. Uh, Puente said that she confessed fully to it in order to get the trial over and done with and was trying to put that behind her. Cabrera pointed out that the similarities in the modus operandi were there. The only difference now is rather than thieving from living victims, she may simply be killing her targets instead. And now Cabrera said, You've got a man like Bert Montoya, someone with no previous fixed address and mental issues who, quote, might be in Costa Rica or Timbuktu that nobody really cares about. If you disappear and you're a transient, you're a bum or an alcoholic, a lot of people... Uh, think that nobody ever cares. At this point, Puente seemed agitated. I cared for him. I bought clothes for him. I treated him very, very good. After briefly referring again to the disappearance of Ben Fink and asserting that they would have heard something from a drunk like him in Marysville, Cabrera returned to the nub of the issue. Are there any other bodies in your backyard? Look, they're going to go digging anyway. Why are you... D I feel like this interview is happening very early. Why don't they just arrest her? Because there's bodies in her garden. I mean, obviously enough to keep her in jail for a while at least. Uh, they they can charge her with that somehow, something. Suspected murder. <laughs> Seems legit. And then go dig up the garden and come with complete information. 
I didn't even know that there was a body back there, Puente replied. Uh, did Mr. McCauley put any bodies back there? Cabrera pressed her. You'd have to ask Mr. McCauley, Puente said flatly. Cabrera asked whether McCauley had been a resident at F Street since March 1985, like McCauley himself claimed. Puente denied this, saying that he'd only lived there for two years, and after a brief pause, during which both Cabrera and Puente took a sip from their cups, picking them up and setting them down simultaneously, Cabrera continued, Dorothea, I know if we dig, we're going to find more. I know that. Well, I didn't put him there. I couldn't drag a body any place, Puente replied. Cabrera pointed at her excitedly and said, I believe that. But I also believe there's somebody else involved here. Dorothea, I think somehow you're involved in it. It may not be by your hand, but it is by somebody's hand. And I think you are very, very frightened right now. But Dorothea didn't budge. She pointed the blame at people who might have lived in the house before she returned in 1985. She vaguely implied that Macaulay might have something to do with the body that the police found, but she never dared to accuse Macaulay openly. Dorothea was released without charge and went back to F Street where she spent the night. Didn't we just say? I feel like we've had two conversations. One about how she previously tried to flee to Mexico when she was caught for much less crimes. What was she, forging checks? I mean, and now she's got bo bodies buried in the backyard, and they're like, nah, nah, nah. Go on home. It's fine. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. Don't leave town. Don't think about fleeing to Mexico. I'll be watching. But they're not. She's going to flee to Mexico. Why wouldn't she flee to Mexico? You'd have to be insane not to flee to Mexico. Black coffee, dark thoughts, darker deeds. The coroner confirmed that the body in Dorothea's backyard belonged to an unidentified elderly woman. The coroner also determined that the scraps of undyed leather found in the hole were actually strips of skin that had fallen off the body as it had decomposed. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, as if it were peel the peel of a banana, the flesh had dried out and hardened slightly while it lay buried in the hard ground. The next morning, on November the 12th, 1988, Dorothea was back at her house on F Street, observing the unfolding scene from her window. In the backyard was a massive CSI team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not John, your contractor, doing this. It's CSI. Complete with shovels, brushes, and mechanical digger, getting ready for a long day's work. In front of the house was a growing crowd of journalists and onlookers who had shown up to watch despite the rainy weather. Weather. A few minutes before the day's digging began, Dorothea Puente walked up to Sergeant Cabrera. She asked him anxiously, Am I under arrest? Cabrera replied that she was not, and inquired why she asked. <laughs> She just replies, yeah, 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 definitely not thinking about fleeing to Mexico right now. Definitely not. That digger's going to find nothing. Everything's fine. I'm just going to pop to the post office for a while. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I need my passport to uh, to, to, to check my bank uh, account at the post. I'll, I'll be back. I'll be right back. Jet to Mexico immediately. Puente explained that the presence of all the police, the media, and the gawking bystanders had made her very anxious and upset. She asked Cabrera permission to go with John McCauley to the nearby Clarion Hotel, where she would meet her nephew Ricardo, who owns 1426 F Street, for a cup of coffee. Sergeant Cabrera, well, I, 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 about the nephew owning it, my theory about her murdering the previous owner and then forging the documents, stabbing it in her name, I was wrong. That would have been a, that would have been a fun twist if this was made into a movie. Maybe that could be the twist. You know how it's like based on a true story. That could have made it more interesting. <laughs> Scriptwriter Simon. Uh, Sergeant Cabrera asked his commanding officer, who said they didn't have sufficient evidence to detain either Puente or Macaulay. Are you f kidding me, mate? How? There's bodies in her garden. If, if the police came around to my house and found bodies in my garden, I'll be like, I didn't put them there, but I know I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> There's bodies in the garden. It's like bodies in the attic. Yo, yo, you're getting arrested or they're like asking you not to. They put some tracker on you or something like that, right? Or you have to pay bail. Like, get arrested, pay some big-ass bail, although she's not getting bail because she's fleeing to Mexico. How is there not enough evidence? Additionally, despite the inconsistencies in Puente's stories, she had been immensely cooperative with police investigations up to that point. She had voluntarily allowed the police to search her home and to search her backyard. She had sat in interrogation without a lawyer. Cabrera came back and granted her request. My dude, no! Being cautious, Cabrera walked with Puente Macaulay toward the hotel. Puente was wearing a long red coat due to the weather and was bearing a large handbag. Cabrera watched for a while to make sure that Puente Macaulay entered the hotel. Then he slowly went back to digging. Uh, to the digging site. 21 minutes later, the CSI team unearthed a second body. Police rushed to the hotel coffee shop to arrest Puente and Macaulay. What is going on, cops? 
why if you're like there's a second body now we know arrest them how was one body not enough it's like oh no no you're not a murderer until you've killed two people one's fine it's like murder me once shame on you murder twice then you go to prison that makes no sense terrible analogy but you get my meaning what's going on police they were nowhere to be found shocking a brief inter- investigation found that they departed the area roughly 15 minutes prior in a taxi cab from there they went to a bar in sacramento okay <laughs> should we uh should we go to the airport and get on a flight to mexico yeah 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 but let's stop for a quick drink first shan't we i mean our nerves are on edge they're digging up bodies in the garden right now let's pop in for a quick pint and then we'll get right to the airport Despite it still being morning, Dorothea downed a couple of vodkas with orange juice and Macaulay drank beer. From the bar, the two fugitives split up, with Macaulay hiding out in the squalor of the homeless community downtown, and with Buenze catching a cab to Stockton, California, where she was dropped off at a bus station. It would later be determined that with such, uh, with her large, bulging handbag, Buenze was carrying upwards of 3,000 cash in small bills to facilitate her escape. Oh, they're in Sacramento, right? In my mind, I'm still picturing this happening in New York. Like, all of the scenes are kind of like the gray of new york rather than the like orange of california again like my whole most of my knowledge of america is just like movies but um yeah so she's just gonna pop on a bus down to mexico not a plane obviously it's right that it's close to the border i don't know when cabrera heard that the prime suspect in a multiple murder and missing persons case had slipped the net by playing the distressed old woman slipped the net by playing the distressed old woman david no the police like were like yeah 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 no worries you can go hang out at the hotel this is the police's fault she must be like bro are you smoking crack as soon as you leave i'm getting the out of here what is going on uh and asked to go get a cup of coffee mere minutes before she knew mere minutes before she knew another body would be discovered a sickening feeling settled in the pit of his stomach and quote i felt like someone had ripped my insides out yo cabrera mate what i uh, i don't know i obviously must be missing something because it's such an insane decision to let her go over the next few days with prince having completely disappeared even more bodies were dragged out of shallow graves in the garden at 1426 f street including that of alvaro Bert montoya the 52 year old was murdered just as he was finally getting a chance at a fresh start and a better life the devil's golden girl Dorothea Helen Gray was born uh, January the 9th, 1929, in San Bernardino County, California, to Trudy and Jesse James Gray. Someone called their kid Jesse James? All right. His father worked as a cotton picker. Dorothea's claim that Puente is her maiden name is a lie, and there is absolutely zero indication that she is even remotely Hispanic. Dorothea is of predominantly English, Irish, and Scottish descent. Nevertheless, Dorothea circulated the lie that she was born in Mexico to a devoutly Catholic family of 18 children. She had three siblings not 18. all of this seems to have been done to gain the confidence of people in the predominantly hispanic neighborhood in sacramento where dorothea gray ran a boarding house enjoyed a good reputation and accrued the nickname of la doctora both of her parents were alcoholics a trait that seems to have been accentuated by the stresses of the great depression which began the year of dorothea's birth jesse james gray also appears to have been depressed frequently threatening to kill himself in front of his wife and children dorothea was no older than eight years old when she was subjected to this the family existed in both poverty and squalor due to recurrent parental alcoholism and very often dorothea had to scavenge for food this is one of those situations normally you know it comes and it's like oh we look at the person who's become a serial killer and they've been like abused by their parents or whatever and this is abuse but it's obviously a very different form of abuse where it's like you can't you know alcoholism is a disease depression is a disease uh you it's not like they were choosing to beat their children or whatever this is just abuse but it's more it's just sad jesse james contracted tuberculosis a disease which was treatable by the 1930s although not curable it certainly did not need to be fatal but due to his poverty his lifestyle and his suicidal ideation jesse james did his best arthur morgan impression and died in 1937 his tuberculosis entirely untreated trudy gray was evidently such a rampant alcoholic that she lost custody of her four children in 1938 highly unusual for an alcoholic mother in that time so she must have been in a very bad way or else lost them deliberately before dying in a motorcycle accident that same year yeah like alcoholism and motorcycles probably like i don't know if you like drinking a lot let's just i mean maybe motorcycles the better option actually because if you get in a car while you're drunk you're probably more likely to kill other people 
Whereas if you're on a motorbike, you're more likely to kill your- This is so dark, Simon. Where are you going with this? Good lord. Just get on with the bloody story. Meanwhile, Dorothea and her siblings were briefly packed off to an orphanage before they were taken in by relatives in Fresno. During Dorothea's time at the orphanage, she was sexually abused. Like with the upbringing of many serial killers, it was a case of out of the frying pan and into another equally hot frying pan filled with dog shit or in the fire, if you prefer. Let's go with the fire. Dorothea's upbringing in Fresno was not a happy time. Her relatives were not loving, but merely acting out of family duty. Dorothea was largely regarded as a burden, ignored, and not expected to amount to much. She had come from the gutters of society and wasn't expected to crawl much beyond them. This lack of affection cultivated a textbook and grandiose sense of self-importance in Dorothea so she could compensate for a deeply rooted self-loathing and self-esteem so low that it was next to dinosaur bones. This inferiority complex also birthed Dorothea's lifelong addiction to lying in order to make herself out to be more important and talented than she really was. And much to the detriment and frustration of my own research, Dorothea never broke with this chronic habit till the day she died. Yeah. It's like, this is another problem. Like, I uh, do these other YouTube channels where you cover, like, history and stuff. And there's so many, like, ancient historians where it's like, they just made stuff up. Like, Herodotus. It's like, yeah, 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 Herodotus wrote this. Might be, like, might be true, might not be true. You never know. It's Herodotus. And when you got, like, chronic liars and you're doing something like this, it's like, well, you just don't know what's true. You just don't know what's... I, I'm always like, just assume it's all a lie and just try and base it on evidence. I feel the same way about that as I do about eyewitness testimony. It's just not reliable. So just base it on, uh, you know, what the CSI team discovers, the evidence, the, 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 the hard evidence. In late 1945, when Dorothea Gray was only 16, she met a soldier, Fred McFall, who was recently demobbed from the Japanese theater at the end of World War II. After a very brief romance lasting only a few weeks, the teenage Dorothea married the GI, who was eager to return to a quote-unquote normal life after witnessing the horrors of war. This is reminiscent of many boomer hookups in the post-war period. <laughs> boomer hookups. It's like the baby boomers, but boomers like so like okay boomer nowadays. I like it. The source of many of history's first no-fault divorces. In 19 someone was telling me, oh my god, there was I said I, I said like alright boomer or okay boomer in another video I made where someone was just saying the most boomer shit ever. And someone was like writing me on YouTube, writing me on Twitter, saying like how it's ageist and offensive and all of this stuff, and I'm like, mate, relax. <laughs> I don't think, like, ageism. It's like, I can make fun of old people. Ageism is where it's like someone applies for a job and you discriminate for them based on their age. Is ageism gonna be, like, the new thing where it's like you can't make fun of old people? It's like, or young people? It's like, yo, we've all been young. We're all gonna be old. <laughs> it's like, okay, I know someday I'm gonna get super old and out of touch and, like, people are gonna be like, Simon, that's not politically right. So I'll be like, I've lived well, so I'm back in my day. And I know we're all gonna get like that. I mean, hopefully less so. Now, I, I don't know. I hope I don't. But I also know I'm going to get, like, old and stupid. <laughs> I mean, hopefully. Unless I get killed earlier. But it's like, okay, mate, who the, the OK Boomer dude. It's just like, relax, all right? Take it easy. Chill out. It's not that important. Uh, this is reminiscent of many baby boomer hookups in the post-war period and the source of many of history's first no-fault divorces. In 1946, Dorothea gave birth to a daughter. She had another daughter in 1948. Dorothea got pregnant again that same year, but suffered a mis miscarriage. Not long afterward, Fred McFall left her. Some sources attributed this to Dorothea's miscarriage. This isn't true. In reality, Fred abandoned her due to her drunken and promiscuous behavior with no formalities and only years later sought a de facto divorce. But in 1948, Dorothea lied that Fred had died of a heart attack shortly after their marriage. A tragic tale of true love masking the humiliation of a failed marriage. The probably shouldn't have happened in the first place. Possibly following her mother's footsteps immediately after the divorce, Dorothea palmed one of her daughters off on some relatives who lived in Sacramento, and not finding any takers for the second daughter, Dorothea dumped her in an orphanage. Ah, oh, man, like... I don't know. I mention this all the time. It's just like, look after your kids, people. Come on. Come on. Come on. You did this. In order to keep up with the lie that Fred had died shortly after the wedding, Dorothea did not recognize she was mother of either child until several decades afterwards. When her second daughter visited Dorothea at 1426 F Street in 1986, she described Dorothea as a woman lacking a personality. Savage. Um, I know people... I, I'm always curious about this. Like, people who were, you know, if I was this woman's daughter... Um, and she'd abandoned me in an orphanage after she couldn't get family to take me in. My desire to go and see this woman would be absolutely none. And I don't know if you feel differently because you're like, oh, they're my biological parents or whatever. I've got to find out what they're like. I'll be like, sure, I want to know what they're like. 
So I'll just look up their Instagram or their Facebook and be like, oh, okay, still a d-. Um, but I wouldn't want to go meet them. It just sounds uncomfortable. And they were a d- anyway. In truth, Dorothea would rarely display any emotion or assertiveness in any of her social encounters. We know what that sounds like. Sounds like she might be a psychopath. She was not prone to laugh, smile, frown, or cry. She stayed largely impassive in conversation and very rarely volunteered any information about herself. Dorothea was too busy reading you so she could play you to care about personal about sharing personal information about herself. A lot of people feel an emotional release or stress relief when venting and sharing with another person. Not so with Dorothea. She usually listen and react to whatever the other person was saying and strategically venture a sharp phrase here and there to have maximum manipulative impact. As a result of this passivity, 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 this apparent harmlessness, more prone to listen sympathetically than talk, it's no wonder she managed to cultivate trust in many people. It's also no wonder many people thought she was wise. The only thing people were not expecting is how often should be able to plant a well-placed lie masquerading as a widow in 1948 and without any children to support dorothea tried a hand of forging checks in order to purchase things and pay her own bills dorothea's reluctance to get an actual job would be a recurring theme throughout the rest of her life she was quickly caught by the police because of her forgeries and sentenced to a year in prison but was paroled after six months dorothea rarely acknowledged the time she spent in prison and spun a tale of her own in 1948 according to her she was shopping in a department store in san francisco when she was spotted by a talent scout for the Radio City Rocketeers, flown to New York for an audition, was hired on the spot. Dorothea claims that she spent half a week in New York before flying back to San Francisco to work in the kitchens of a seafood restaurant. Dorothea Gray's stage name was allegedly, allegedly Sharon Nayada, which she would later transform in life to the alias Taya Singaloa Nayada, posing as a Muslim of Egyptian and Israeli descent. During her time dancing with the Rockettes, Dorothea claims that she met John F. Kennedy and his wife Jackie and became best friends with actress Rita Hayworth. <laughs> Dude, one of the things with lies, don't make them too elaborate. Like, that's another rule. If you're going to lie, make it simple. Because when it gets like, yeah, 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 I was a dancer and then I was this. And then I had this complex backstory. And then I did this. And then we met the Kennedys. And then I was best friends with Rita Hayworth. And it's like, just just be like, oh, I was a dancer in New York for six months. Um, yeah. And then if someone asked me, like, yeah, there was a scout thing. And yeah, it was fine. <laughs> Much more believable right there. Allegedly in 1957, Dorothea and another dancer fell into the orchestra pit. Oh my God, why go this deep? And Dorothea broke her leg while the other dancer became paralyzed. The broken leg tragically ended Dorothea's dancing career. During the same period in the 1950s, Dorothea claimed that she played regularly as a professional golfer in the LPGA. <laughs> ah. Oh my god, it's like when your life's boring, just make up a more interesting life. It's like, yeah, 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 before this, I was, I was, I was tennis. I was a big tennis player. Yeah, just, uh, it's, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, total sidetrack but uh i i would learn czech like I, I live in prague and i was learning the czech language and uh my tutor is like tell me something interesting and i accidentally said that i went to play tennis i meant to say like i'd like to play tennis or whatever and she was like oh so you play tennis and i'm like you know just because it's a lesson it's a language lesson and i'm like yeah yeah sure let's just continue down this path it's not a lie it's just like a way to practice conversation and then the next thing I know, she thinks I'm a professional tennis player. And I'm like, oh my God, this is not what I intended. And then she'd be like, did you play tennis this, like years later, did you play tennis this week? And I'd be like, yes, <laughs> I never played tennis since I was a kid. I just got too deep in the lie. It was terrible. And I didn't want to just say to her, I'm sorry. I know it's been, I know it's been like, and then years go by and you're like, I'm not, I, I don't play tennis. And then she'd be like, well, why did you lie to me? And I'm like, I didn't mean to, it just got out of control. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> Sorry, that was such a side tangent. Needless to say, this entire story is absolute shit. Most likely, the only thing true about it is that after her release from prison in 1949, Dorothea violated the terms of her probation by fleeing to San Francisco, where she worked in the kitchens of a seafood restaurant. The, what, the only, the only believable part, the only part of the story that's true is the only believable part shocking a few years later still in san francisco dorothea met a swedish merchant seaman named axel johansson they married in 1952 and lived in mostly sacramento for the next several years axel's job typically took him to the sea on a frequent basis and dorothea would spend his wages on gambling drinking and she'd regularly have affairs with other men johansson and dorothea would separate multiple times over the course of their marriage but for years dorothea evidently found a way to convince axel 
to reconcile. In 1960, while still married to Johansson, Dorothea was caught in a Sacramento brothel by an undercover policeman when she offered to give him oral sex. She was given 90 days in the slammer for owning and operating a brothel. Whoa! <laughs> she, she, she was caught in a brothel and that's like, yeah, you, she owned it. Damn. Shortly after her release, Johansson and Dorothea committed to the DeWitt, had Dorothea committed to the DeWitt State Hospital, where she was placed on antipsychotics. While there, psychologists diagnosed Dorothea as being a pathological liar with borderline personality disorder. Dorothea also maintains that she had major cancer surgery in this year when doctors removed her uterus and part of her intestines and stomach. But this likely lies more. Uh, but this is likely more lies from Dorothea. Uh, it is, however, possible that due to her work as a sex worker, Dorothea did have a hysterectomy at some point. Dorothea's and Axel's marriage dragged on for a further five years until their eventual divorce in 1966. Bizarrely, according to Dorothea, she and Axel maintained a friendship right up until her death. He even sent her Christmas cards in prison, though we only have Dorothea's word for this, and Johansson has, has routinely declined to talk to journalists. Regardless, yeah, I mean, that's like... That was this Johansson dude. I mean, that was a super dark period of my life where I made this terrible mistake of, of marrying this woman. I don't want to talk about it. Why would I talk to journalists? It just makes me look bad and makes me relive shit I don't want to relive. Regardless, Dorothea retained Axel's last name and operated under the alias Sharon Johansson for a few years afterward. It was during this time that Dorothea transitioned from being the bawdy housewife and cat house madam to being a kind and caring Protestant Christian who engaged in works of charity. She funded this with her ex-husband's alimony checks. For a couple of years, Dorothea ran a shelter for impoverished women, which may have been a front for another brothel, and then ran a rehabilitation program for alcoholics. Naturally, she had no qualifications or state license to run a rehab, and it's likely she was running some sort of welfare scam, getting the drunks to sign their new support checks over to her. <laughs> her life is like, yeah, she's finally doing something good, and I'm immediately like, she's not. It's a scam. It's a scam. It's a scam. It's like... When someone who's been a con man or a criminal for their whole life and then they start running a charity because they're reformed, be like, maybe before you donate to that charity, look into it real extra thoroughly. In 1968, 39, I'm not saying people can't change. People change all the time. Mostly not, but they do. And uh, but I'm just saying a little bit more due diligence because of the, the history, you know? In 1968, 39-year-old Dorothea married 23-year-old Roberto Puente, a Mexican immigrant who reportedly used Dorothea for her money, what meager ill-gotten gains that she had accrued, and to land American citizenship. Their marriage was a violent one. Dorothea filed for divorce in 1969 after a marriage of just 16 months, citing domestic abuse. However, Puente never submitted to divorce proceedings and simply fled back to Mexico in order to avoid getting collared for alimony payments. The divorce would not be finalized until 1973. Meanwhile, it is clear that Roberto Puente was something of a monster, having returned to the United States and being of such a violent disposition that Dorothea had to file a restraining order against Roberto in 1975. Meanwhile, when, when your alleged serial killer wife... I don't know if she was serial killing people back then. Wait, it was a decade before the 1980s, so quite possibly. Um, you're filing a, when you're, fi you're a serial killer fi filing a, a restraining order against someone? <laughs> that person's bad. Meanwhile, back in 1969, Dorothea matured her most recent scam and rented a 16-bedroom boarding house at 2100 F Street, just down the road from the 1988 murder house. A Harmless Old Woman It was at this point in Dorothea's career that she began donning the false signs of advanced age that became her calling card. She claimed to be 20 or 30 years older than she was. Dorothea began wearing granny glasses and old lady clothing that better belonged in the 1930s or 40s when Dorothea was still a child and teenager. She didn't bother dyeing her hair, so it gradually turned a silvery color. She avoided wearing makeup. She had the remainder of her teeth pulled. Oh my god, that is commitments. Some of them had gotten rotten in previous years of hard leave living and regularly went around without wearing dentures. The effects of having toothless gums contracted the skin around her mouth, sucking it inward to give an extreme impression of senescence. It was almost like she was deliberately going for the look of the granny from Bugs Bunny. In addition, Dorothea began acting absent-minded, frail, and harmless. But the retired fraudster, drunk, sex worker, outpatient, and brothel owner was only 40 years old. It would be like if Simon in five or six years pulled out all of his teeth, dyed his, be dyed his beard white, and started hobbling around hunched over a cane, muttering about darn whippersnappers. Yeah, yeah. I, to, I feel like, I don't know. 
My face wouldn't look that old. You'd be like, you don't have any wrinkles around your eyes. I mean, maybe in five or six years I would. But I don't know. I feel like that would be really hard to pull off like 30 years older. So I'd be like mid 60s. That'd be tough. Also, I don't want to pulling out the teeth. Good Lord. Dorothea began working hard to be a pillar of the community. She was a regular participant in fundraisers and charities. <laughs> By the way, like one thing I always thought like later in life as a kid, you know, you're always like, you're 16. It's like, yeah, I really like to get some beer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> young kids trying to buy alcohol. And as an adult, I was like, why didn't you just dress up as an old man? <laughs> like, because I worked in a store. I, you only ever ID people who look young. It's never like there's some super old dude. He comes in and he's like hunched over and his body's barely working. Just dress as a super old man, put like some old man mask on or some shit. Just go there, buy some like booze. No one's going to question you because you don't ID someone who looks like they're 90. You're welcome, teenagers of the world. Uh, she was a regular participant in fundraising charity. She hosted Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And it's clear that these activities were an excellent way of recruiting needy cases to move into a boarding house. Dorothea also performed the service that social worker Judy Moyes would do two decades later. She'd find particularly troubled individuals and help them sign up for social welfare programs. Nevertheless, nobody suspected any fraud at the time. During the 1970s, Dorothea gained her reputation as a saint of the community. In her capacity, as a charity worker, Dorothea also claims to have met Ronald Reagan, Spino Agnew, Sp Spiro Agnew, and Clint Eastwood, all of which does appear to be bull. <laughs> Why? Why? Yes. <laughs> all right. In 1976, Dorothea married her fourth husband, Pedro Montalvo, a violent alcoholic who evidently didn't think Dorothea was much of a catch either, since he fled the marriage within a few months. Dorothea then conducted her romantic activities by frequenting bars, meeting elderly gentlemen, and trying to talk them out of their pensions and social security payments. Meanwhile, the boarding house scam was working gangbusters. A regular turnover of tenants entered the 16-room boarding house at 2100 F Street, drunks, drug addicts, and the mentally ill, and Dorothea managed to get them to hand over control of their welfare payments. Evidently, Dorothea was netting upwards of $5,000 a month profit from this scam, which is about $20,000 to $25,000 today. Damn. Also, is this a scam? Because she was like, she gets them to sign over the welfare checks. If they're doing it voluntarily and they're staying in a house, isn't it like, well, that's how much it costs to stay in the house? Which, I mean, 16 bedrooms, $25,000 a month, if it's... Is that so unreasonable? I guess, that's like quite a lot. But uh, I guess it's like half scam, half not scam. Sort of. Unfortunately for Dorothea, in 1978, she was caught and given five years probation. Okay, it was definitely a scam because she got in trouble. I mean, the the, the signing over the checks thing, that's like... that That sounds dodgy. Uh, and had to pay $4,000 in restitution. She was also banned from operating a boarding house. Seeing as she was making $5,000 a month from the scam, and then only had to pay $4,000 in restitution, that's a little bit weird. Instead, Dorothea pivoted to drugging and robbery for a time. Those are definitely crimes. She was reported to have entered hospitals disguised as a nurse, providing patients with drugged food and drink before relieving them of any valuables that they might have had with them. She also entered the homes of three elderly women under the guise of friendship, drugged them, and then stole any money and jewelry that they had in their houses. Due to her posing as a harmless old woman and due to the disorientation and vulnerability of her victims, she was able to move without detection for a time. In early 1982, in violation of her probation, Dorothea rented a nine-bedroom place at 1426 F Street to begin operating a boarding house again. She invited 61-year-old Ruth Monroe, her partner in a small catering business, to live with her and act as the unwitting frontwoman of the operation. It is fairly clear Monroe thought she was operating a charity and did not know that Dorothea was running a scam. Within a few weeks, Monroe became gravely ill, alarming her family. Nonetheless, Dorothea claimed that she was a nurse who had served in the Battle of Bataan in 1942 and pledged that she'd take good care of her friend. Monroe died of an overdose of codeine and Tylenol. Dorothea claimed to authorities that Monroe had been depressed for a long time and police ruled the death as a suicide. In reality, Dorothea had murdered Ruth Monroe and continued to run the boarding house herself. Meanwhile, Dorothea drained thousands of dollars belonging to Monroe from their joint account for the, for the catering business. In May 1982, Dorothea met 74-year-old Malcolm McKenzie at a bar, drugged him, and he watched helplessly as she stole his cash, valuables, and even the diamond ring off his pinky finger. McKenzie accused Dorothea of the crime, and she was promptly arrested. After a police investigation, Dorothea was linked to an additional four druggings and robberies. She was given five years and began her sentence in August of 1982. How do you think you're going to get away with this for so long? At some point, they're going to be... 
but those women she like robbed and from their direct from their houses and stuff before or the nurse in hospital isn't like a sketch artist or someone eventually or they're gonna set up a sting because she keeps coming back to the same hospital or whatever i'm amazed she got away with it for so long it's like yeah of course malcolm mckenzie gets robbed at a bar and then he's like yo this woman robbed me at a bar i think we can find her and they find her and arrest her <laughs> how do you think i guess like people are you you just assume people won't remember your face well enough or something when the family of Ruth Monroe heard about Dorothea's conviction, conviction, they begged the police to reopen an investigation into Monroe's death. This was ignored. Instead, Monroe's death would remain a suicide until Dorothea's old of other victims were dragged out of the yard at 1426 F Street in 1988. Now, during her time in prison for theft, drugging, and fraud, Dorothea began corresponding with a 77-year-old man, Everson Gilmouth who lived in Oregon. When Dorothea was released from prison on good behavior in September 1985, Gilmouth fetched her from prison uh, from the prison gates in a red 1984 pickup truck. Dorothea managed to convince Gilmouth to marry her, to set up a joint bank account, and resume renting out 1426 F Street. Gilmouth also collected a regular retirement pension. <laughs> How This woman is a master of manipulation to get all these people to do all this crazy sh**. Within two months, Dorothea had murdered Gilmouth, continued collecting his pension checks, and wrote letters to Gilmouth's relatives saying that the reason why he hadn't been in contact was because he was dreadfully ill. In November 1985, Dorothea contacted handsman Ismael Flores to work on wood paneling at 1426F Street and also to build her a six-foot-long wooden box for junk storage. She then placed Gilmouth's corpse in the box, nailed it shut, and instructed Flores to take the box to a storage locker. <laughs> why? This is involving someone else in your crimes very unnecessarily like don't if you're if you've killed someone don't find someone else and hire them to help you dispose of the body that's just bad that's just not smart joining him for the ride dorothea changed her mind and told flores to simply dump the box uh on the bank of a river so that she could save money flores was paid 800 dollars for the work along with a red 1984 pickup truck which dorothea said it once belonged to her boyfriend but he didn't need it anymore I mean, okay. That's okay, seriously well paid. 800 bucks back in the day. And a car? Gilmer's body was discovered a year later and remained unidentified for a further three years until early 1989 when bodies had been popping out of the grounds at 1426F Street and investigators put two and two together. Kind of amazed that they put that two and two together. That uh, seems like a stretch to me. From November 1985 to November 1988, Dorothea continued to operate a boarding house, despite it being a parole violation and handling the welfare checks of her desperate tenants, also a violation. When parole officers visited the house, she always managed to lie and convince them she was simply taking in tenants and had nothing to do with their financial affairs. When necessary, Dorothea coached the tenants themselves to lie to the authorities. Parole officers visited 1426F Street 15 times in three years and never issued a single warning or citation and never filed a negative report. That harmless old woman act was serving Dorothea well. Dorothea took in roughly 40 tenants during the three-year period at 1426F Street. Her modus operandi was to gain control of a victim's finances, if possible, and keep collecting their welfare checks long after she'd murdered them. Don't the welfare people like get onto the facts that you're dead or even if you've disappeared? I mean, I guess it's just like giant bureaucracy and no one knows what the fuck's going on. But still, I mean, someone should be keeping an eye on that shit, like more closely. Because otherwise you get this woman Dorothea like stealing everyone's money and getting rich off it. Which is really not good at all. And she murdered them. Worse. Her preferred method of killing was drug overdoses. She would move their bodies in the middle of the night and uh, when, the other tenants were, when the other tenants were asleep, install the bodies in an unoccupied bedroom for a few days to a couple of weeks <laughs> nasty bodily fluids leaked out of the corpses during decomposition soaking through the bedroom's carpet and into the wooden floors when police rolled back the carpet the stains were highly visible and the smell was almost overpowering the rotting smell is what disturbed tenant and whistleblower john sharp and also disturbed dorothea's next door neighbor whom she told the smell was just from fertilizer that she'd laid down in the backyard uh-oh. Dorothea hired a number of ex-convicts from a nearby halfway house to dig holes and pour concrete in her backyard, and also made use of the services of longtime tenant John McCauley. When the graves were ready, Dorothea would move the corpses down the stairs in the dead of night and out into the yard. The only telltale signs would be the thudding of a body on the stairs, heard by John Sharp. <clears throat> this is it's amazing that she's doing all of this while there's so many people around. And getting away with it for so long. She's like, 
there's witnesses, there's tons, there's paper trails. This is bold crimes. And I'm amazed you got away with it for so long. Dorothea's boarding house was a revolving door of welfare fraud. She took control of most of her tenants' cash, even if she didn't murder them. However, killing the people she defrauded reduced the chances of someone kicking up a fuss and getting her caught, and also allowed Dorothea to collect far more than the measly individual payouts that each welfare case received from the state government. With each new victim, Dorothea increased her annual income, which would continue to flow in long after her victims were dead and buried. It's amazing that no one picked up on this paper trail. There's like 40 people living at this tiny house with like six beds. Uh, nine bedrooms, 16 bedrooms, something like that. Either way, way too many. She would keep collecting the money for a year or two after she'd killed them. So long as Dorothea chose her victims carefully and only murdered tenants with no family or close contacts and who were unlikely to be declared missing, the checks would keep getting mailed to 1426 F Street. Dorothea estimated to have murdered between 9 and 15 people while running the boarding house. Seven bodies were uncovered in Dorothea's yard in, yard in various stages of decomposition, with additional victims like Gilmouths uh, being disposed of elsewhere. The nine victims whom Dorothea was charged with killing were the lonely pensioner boyfriend Gilmuth, her duped business partner Monroe, tenant Leona Carpenter, the 78-year-old woman whose femur Sergeant Cabrera had initially mistaken for a tree trunk, Alvaro Bert Montoya, whose disappearance kicked off the investigation, Dorothy Miller, an alcoholic whose medication bottle was found by Cabrera and whom Dorothea Puente had claimed was a visiting relative, Benjamin Fink, the alcoholic who Dorothea had claimed to have evicted, James Gallup, an impoverished man dying of brain cancer, and two other women, Vera Faye Martin and Betty Palm, who's ma who had major health problems and no money, and who treated the boarding house as a low-rent hospice. One of the bodies discovered in the backyard buried was buried next to a small statue of the Virgin Mary, Mary and it lacked its hand, head, hands, and feet, which made identification difficult. Never trust a gold digger. Dorothea fled Sacramento. <laughs> oh yeah. Ah, we go back to this. She just ran away. Of course she did. Of course she did. And now even more so, we're like, oh my god, of course. Uh, on the morning of November the 12th, 1988, after stopping, stopping off at a bar for a few screwdrivers to bolster her courage. Oh, like the cocktail. I'm like, what? Why is she buying screw screwdrivers? The, co the, 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 the cocktail. She caught a cab to Stockton, California, where she boarded a bus for Los Angeles. While in LA, Dorothea checked into the Royal Viking Motel. She rarely left her room for the next three days, except to order food. She spent most of her time monitoring the news for information on the manhunt. Due to the sensational nature of the story, namely a bunch of dead bodies found in a quote-unquote old lady's backyard, Dorothea was splashed all over the news. Police had extended a dragnet for Dorothea across California, and all the way down to Mexico. Meanwhile, John McCauley was busted in downtown Sacramento. He was later released without charge due to a lack of evidence of his involvement in the murders. Okay, but let's ask him not to leave town, shall we? The other ex-convicts evidently had no idea that they were being paid cash to dig holes for bodies. One of the ex-convicts, however, was named Don Anthony, the man whom Dorothea had paid to phone charity worker Judy Moyes with the cock and bull story about Bert Montoya moving to Utah with relatives. He had stuffed up initially giving his real name. <laughs> ah, spectacular. Spectacular. Um, before correcting himself and giving a supposedly more Hispanic sounding one. Though, in my opinion, the fake name he gave, Michael Obergon, obviously sounded more French. But you just can't find good help these days. On Dorothea's fourth day in her motel room, she got a little stir crazy. She went out to a nearby bar to do some serious drinking. Dorothea eventually fell into conversation with a retired carpenter named Charles Wilgers. She introduced herself as Donna Johansson. The two drank a fair amount and talked into the late afternoon during the conversation. People just getting smashed in the middle of the day. <laughs> it's so alien. Like, I mean, I've done it a couple of times, like when I was a student, like I'd just be like, Yeah, should we go out for lunch? <laughs> you're like We had we had class this afternoon, didn't we? We'd be like, Yeah, but I'm too drunk for that now. <laughs> should we carry on drinking? Um, but like doing this as an adult man is just a little bit unusual to me. Just <laughs> especially in the morning. It's like good lord. During the conversation, Dorothy and Pepper Charles with questions about his pension, welfare payments, and even suggested they should live together. Oh my god. The couple made a date to go shopping the next day, and they arranged for Charles to pick up Dorothy at the Royal Viking Motel. Charles went home with a strange feeling that this woman was a little bit creepy. Yeah, because you're having a drink in a bar in the middle of the day, then you get smashed with an old woman who's like, we should live together, and then you're like, no, <laughs> no, no, 
No. The feeling was confirmed when Charles recognized Dorothea as he turned on the television and saw the face of an accused murderer and fugitive staring back at him. He called a local Los Angeles news network informing them of Dorothea's location, and the news station in turn contacted the cops. Why didn't you just phone the police? <laughs> What's up? A few hours later at 10.20 p.m., police descended on the Royal Viking Motel. Dorothea lied and said that her name was Donna Johansson. The police demanded to see some identification. At that point, Dorothea gave up and simply said, All right, fine, my name is Dorothea Puente. And then she surrendered herself to the police. What are you doing hanging out at a motel for four days and going to get shit-faced in the middle of the day with strangers when you're on the run? Again, it's amazing you got away with this for so long seeing as you're just so shit at being a criminal it you should have immediately gone to mexico just immediately however you can you've got thousands of dollars tens of thousands in modern money you should have just gone as fast as you can dorothea was escorted by the cops back to sacramento on a plane borrowed from a traveling news crew <laughs> okay during the flight and into she told the interviewer i have not killed anyone but i cashed the checks i used to be a very good person at one point in time it's clear Dorothea devised her new strategy to reduce the amount of jail time. It is only now that Dorothea began pointing the finger at John McCauley as being responsible for the murders. At only age 59, a few more years jail time for welfare fraud was decidedly preferable to several life sentences for first-degree murder. Forensics failed to establish a cause of death for any of the corpses found in Dorothea's backyard. This is hardly surprising given that all the murders were done with drug overdoses and the bodies themselves have been decomposing for several weeks to several years in the ground. Further frustration the case was the fact that these tenants either dying mentally ill drug addicts or simply depressed were already on a raft of medications like antidepressants antipsychotics and painkillers testing found only one drug in all the bodies and that was darmane used in sleeping pills investigations revealed that between 1985 and 1998 and 1988 dorothea had gained multiple prescriptions for 30 sleeping pills a pop from two different doctors by feeding them a sob story about how she just wanted to help her troubled tenants get to sleep yo what and what sort of doctors like yeah 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 no worries i've not seen you, the these people but i'll give you a giant prescription so that you can give them sleeping bills those doctors someone needs to have a word with them as well i mean they're like the minor criminals in today's story but that sounds like a crime that's that feels like more than an ethics violation or like whatever the the the, the code of doctoring or whatever like come on they need to get in trouble. We shouldn't just be giving sleeping pills to people to give to other people. There's a reason you can give pills to people, because you're a doctor. But it was difficult to nail down this drug to the cause of death since each body had been in the ground for a different amount of time and the drug had progressively leached out into the soil. Thus, each victim had a different level of drug in the system. Furthermore, it was unclear whether Dorothea had acquired enough sleeping pills to administer a fatal dose in every circumstance. However, it was plausible that when she did not kill a victim outright with pills, they could easily have rendered the victim inert so that she could suffocate them without any sign of resistance. Although arrested in November 1988, the identification of Gilmouth's body and additional police investigations delayed the beginning of the trial proceedings. Even then, court preliminaries delayed the trial for an additional three years. For instance, the defense put in a mention to have the case moved out of Sacramento to Monterey since the intense media attention would have poisoned any Sacramento jury against Dorothea. Yep, yeah, that's fair. They definitely would. And I think that... that that should be done. Meanwhile, Dorothea was offered a plea deal where if she pled guilty to all nine murders, the prosecution would spare her the death penalty. What? I just made a video about the Manson family and Charles Manson and all that jazz, and they were sentenced to death, but then the death penalty was overturned in California, so people couldn't be sentenced to death. So this is in California. I thought death penalty wasn't on the table. Unless there's federal death penalty, is that a thing? And maybe this was a federal thing? I don't know. I don't know. Dorothea rejected this deal and insisted upon her innocence. She said, Not one person who worked for me saw me doing anything wrong. People were always coming and going. Our colleagues don't stay in one place for long. How did I know where they were? Never showing any remorse for the victims, Dorothea was most concerned about her cat. The trial itself commenced in February 1993. 156 witnesses gave testimony and over 3,000 pieces of evidence were presented. You're getting the death penalty, aren't you? <laughs> this is this is happening. <laughs> the strategy of defense was to admit that Dorothea had stolen the welfare money of her victims. They even went as far as to not deny that Dorothea had buried the bodies in her backyard, but they argued that the cause of death was always natural causes. All these people were either ailing, addicts, or terminally ill. This is actually a clever defense strategy. 
because I'm like, well, why would she do that? And then it's like, so she can keep cashing the checks. You know, she, if she doesn't notify anyone about their death, then the checks keep coming. This is actually a very smart defense strategy. Very nice. I mean, not nice. It's horrible. She should go to prison or be killed. But, uh, but it's a good strategy. When they died, the defense claimed, Dorothea merely took advantage of the situation, concealed their bodies, and continued cashing the checks. Dorothea did not take the stand in her own defense, standard procedure, as she is reported to have sat there passively throughout the five-month trial with a slightly bored expression on her face as if she was only half paying attention. In July 1993, the jury went into deliberation. Eleven out of the twelve jurors thought that she was guilty of murdering her tenants. Only one juror held out saying that burying the bodies when they had no clear cause of death did not prove murder. Deliberation dragged on for 43 days the longest jury deliberation in california history but 11 out of 12 of them were like yeah yeah yeah, guilty it doesn't really sound like a I, though you need 10 you need 10 or 9 or something uh during which the holdout juror was physically attacked by one of his frustrated peers eventually the holdout juror agreed to convicting dorothea on two counts of first degree murder and one count of second degree murder dorothea gray mcfall johansson niada puente montalvo <laughs> good lord was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole and incarcerated at Central California's women's facility in Chowchilla, California. She resided there for almost 20 years, becoming a den mother, cooking Mexican food using ingredients from the prison commissary for her fellow inmates and winning the nicknames Ms. Dorothea and Mama Dorothea. She died there on March the 27th, 2011. Of natural causes, she was 82. She finally attained the age that she'd been faking for almost 40 years. Two years before her death in 2009, a journalist asked Dorothea if she ever wished she had received the death penalty. Dorothea replied, Maybe I would have been better off. It's the same thing. I'm here until I die. The journalist then asked how she'd like her death to happen, and Dorothea said, Peacefully in my sleep, without becoming sick or a cripple. I don't want to burden I don't want to be a burden on anyone. With only one question left, the journalist asked, What's it like being known as a murderer? At which point Dorothea fixed the reporter with a hard stare, and after a moment's bitter silence, she spat, I think the what anyone else thinks yeah no you definitely don't because you're uh you, you you don't have proper emotions you don't have empathy you don't care about other people and things and their feelings dismembered appendices number one the rebellious juror has never explained why he resisted the guilty verdict for so long or why he agreed to the strange compromise of three counts of murder two in the first degree one in the second degree but i really can't see how some of the bodies found in the backyard had more damning evidence attached to them than others and although dorothea had used stooges before to dig holes and make fraudulent phone calls it's highly unlikely that the juror was dorothea's stooge put there to frustrate a guilty verdict it's much more likely that the man was just some kind of idiot or a bit of an arse Maybe he wanted, maybe he's like, I don't want to go back to my life. I like jury duty. They give me free food every day. We sit in this room. I don't have to go to work, get paid a little bit of money. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I'm not sure about that guilty thing. <laughs> and all the other jurors are like, mother we want to go home. She's guilty as sin. Please. We have families and jobs. Number two, when searching 146 F Street, Sergeant Cabrera found a book entitled Drugs and Their Effects, which eh, pretty much amounted to what he called Dorothea's cookbook. Since Dorothea had a reputation as a veteran poisoner, if I were those fellow prison inmates, I'm not sure I would have trusted any of her cooking. It is, however, interesting that she cooked Mexican food, maintaining the Puente persona to win over the prison's large number of Hispanic inmates. <laughs> no, no one found out. It's like she's not actually Mexican. Nah. <laughs> She just pretends. And they're like, yeah, but a Mexican food's pretty tasty. Like my favorite Mexican restaurant. They don't have any Mexican people. But it tastes good. I'll just let it fly. Number three, 1426 F Street was also featured on television in 2015 in a particularly demented episode of Ghost Adventures with professional d bag and patho pathological charlatan Zach Baggins. Allegedly. Uh, where the frat boys turned ghost hunters talk to the ghost of several victims and to the ghost of Dorothea Puente herself. Simon, I'm sure you'd love Zach Baggins. <laughs> Zach Baggins sounds like a d Number four. In the course of my research into Dorothea Puente, Pedro Lopez and Israel Keys, among others, I've taken a look at YouTube and podcasts to see what the competition is doing. Okay, so it's kind of what I do. I was told to find that when some people were not just reading me the Wikipedia page or getting obvious stuff wrong, they were dead ass, they were dead ass making stuff up to pad the runtime. Yes, this is such a thing on YouTube, and it's not just uh, it's not just true crime. 
It's like across the board where it's like there's so little information on something that people will just be like talking around it and making up like little details that, you know, might be wrong, might be right. Who knows? But it's like this really weird blending of fact and fiction. And I'm like, that is, and presenting it as fact. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> interesting approach. Uh, I would feel odd about making up, but you know, just, I don't know. Is that just me as fact boy? Some of the videos in question have millions of views, which makes me despair of the world. However, quite happily, I did stumble across a channel with only 856 subscribers. Someone's about to get a shout out. Uh, run by Victoria with a K Evans, which conducts tireless and detailed research over several weeks or even months and is true crime par excellence. It is honestly the best work I've seen on the internet after the Honorable Callum Howe. Where is he? I don't know where he is. He found us. In a world where the internet dispenses misinformation as often as it does accurate facts, I thought we intrepid seekers after truth should stick together. So I give a colleague's nod of the head to Victoria with a K Evans, whose piece on Israel Keys is particular a masterwork, is a particular masterwork of research and diligence. Well, great stuff, Victoria Evans. Um, I hope people will go check out your channel. We'll put a link below. Uh, this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for being here. I'm aware it's a long one. If you're here right at the end, brilliant. Um, I hope you liked it. If you're listening as a podcast, we love reviews. I love reviews. Uh, five stars preferred, but give it, you know, whatever you want. This this podcast has gone on for so long. My coffee is stone cold, um, but I'm still drinking it. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, comments, blah, 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 blah. Shell, 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 shell. All that kind of stuff. And uh, I will see you next time.